Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 206 of the Tick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Floris Lane, an interview with Trisha Baden. Today's interview is very special because Ali Moresco co-hosted with me and we get really deep and personal with Trish about her Lyme disease journey. Trish goes into great detail about her diagnostic journey and her treatment journey and gives us powerful visualizations about her entire experience. Trish went from being bed bound and given her last rights to the hospital to now flourishing and running a successful business that employs many Lyme warriors that we all know. So without further ado, Floris Lane, the Tick Bootcamp interview with Trish Baden. Hi guys, welcome to Tick Bootcamp. I am so excited to be co-hosting today and torturing Matt. Not only Matt, but also Trish Baden. Welcome <laughs> Trish, I'm so excited this was meant to be. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, before we get back on our tangent about Lyme and dating and all of the things, I want to hear about your background. Who, I mean, I already know who you are because I'm lucky and I'm friends with you, but like, who are you? Where do you live? What do you do? Like, tell me about Trish. Tell me everything. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's start. Mm, well, right now I'm in West Hollywood, California, California, California. <laughs> yeah, I do that all the time when I'm talking. <laughs> um, and let's see, I came here by way of, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. I was born okay. to a single middle mother. Middle. Yeah. Middle child of three women, lovely Love sisters. It. I'm bookended by two nurses um, that are wow. intensely in taking care of me always, um, which is kind of funny. I'll, I'll get back to that, I guess. But my one sister learned how to do pick line changes on me. I was one sister treated cha or trained the other in a clinical setting on me. And I was, it was so cool. My mom was jealous. She missed the moment. Um, oh my anyway. Gosh. Yeah. So, um, I'm the Guinea pig of the family. And, um, so I have a degree. I went to college at Miami University in Oxford, um, studied English and interactive media. So I became like a tech geek, social media nerd. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also like, I don't know, an avid reader and poet and writer, you know, that that was my realm before um, my tick bite, actually, you know, I was really on a track to, in my mind, I I, I wanted to go to law school. I wanted to, um, you know, be a CEO of like a fortune 500 company of some mm -hmm. sort. I don't know, but that's what I was called in my mind. That was like what I was doing. And I wanted to, you know, get married by 30, do the things, you know, the Midwestern linear yeah. living <laughs> of like the 401k and like house and a mortgage and two cars and 3.7 children or whatever it is. <laughs> um, that's what I wanted. And then, um, so like I was dating this guy, um, whom I still love and adore. And we went to his cabin in Northern Wisconsin for 4th of July weekend, which is why I can give you specific dates of when I got bit. I know it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I even know like what music I was listening to, which is crazy. What were you listening um, to? Now you have to tell Tal Cruz, Dynamite. Sorry, Tal Cruz, to like throw you under the bus, but that song <laughs> is like not good for me. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if that song's I, good for anyone in 2021. <laughs> I know. Oh no. It was so, so bad. Yeah. yeah. Oh God. Dark. But I was like obsessed <laughs> with that song and I was like, you know, and so, um, yeah, basically I was gonna like, you know, sail off into the sunset with this man. And we were like going up and, you know, basically pre-engagement vibes. And I, I'm not like a huge woodsy person. Mm -hmm. And so like, we went out to like have a moment on the dock and, um, like I got, um, hit with a branch and like tangled up oh, in God. a branch. And I'm pretty sure that was the moment that the tick got on me. Um, but I actually don't know, but it had to have been in that day. So July 3rd, yeah. yeah 2010. And so the next day, July 4th, I like woke up with a, a tick, well, uh, infected hair in the back of my head, quote unquote, air quotes. Um, and I thought it was really strange because my neck was sore 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's kind of like really weird. And I was like, maybe it's just like a nerve or something. And so I had my boyfriend look at it and he was like, I don't see anything. He's like, I see like a pimple maybe. He's like, but like, you're good. So yeah. the next day I developed a sore throat on that side. And then I was like running a low grade fever and I, and I was like, I think I need to go to the doctor. So the next day I was dead sick and, um, I went to the emergency room and I actually asked the nurse about it. And I was like, do you think it has to do with this infected hair in the back of my head? And she looked at it and she was like, no, this is unrelated. And I was like, okay. And basically they sent me home without any medicine. And I was like, don't send me home like this. <laughs> and so, yeah. um, that was month one. And then what was crazy, I had a moment, this is going to sound super weird. I had a moment where I was laying in bed about three weeks after my bite and I could hear my blood flowing through my ears, like mm-hmm. my heartbeat for the first time. And I was like, I'm sick. Like there's yeah. something wrong. And I was like, this is not right. Like yeah. the way even down to like how my blood was flowing through my body, it wasn't right. And so I had that gut instinct pretty far in, I mean, it was like three to four weeks in, but, and then that next week um, to the Tuesday, I got sick. So four weeks to the day. And it was like, started out on the one side, went to the other. And I went and I was like, this is not a coincidence. I was like, it's yeah. been four weeks. Like that sounds like a life cycle to, to, of some sort to me. Um, and they t- drew my blood and then they were like, it looks like you're having a white blood cell response. So there mm. is an infection. So they just gave me like a generic antibiotics and sent me home. And it was like seven days. And so I felt better almost instantly, but then as soon as the seven days stopped, I was like immediately symptom. And I was like, something's wrong. And they're like, something's wrong with you probably. And I was like, no. And so they're like, can you see someone in our system? Yeah. And I was like, okay. So the first I, and by that time I had started to develop weird things that I thought I was like twitching sort of, and Mm -hmm. like forgetting things. But then I was like, maybe I'm, it's just like starting my first adult job and I was tired and that like explaining it away. Yeah. And because it was getting to like, I had 10 unrelated symptoms, 11, you know, as every week went on, there was another couple symptoms, you Mm -hmm. know, um, everything from facial twitching to weird, like my muscles would tighten at random times or like, um, I wouldn't remember words like fleece or tablecloth or like light switch. Um, or like I would forget people I know have known for a really long time there. I knew their face, but I would forget their name. Um, like, and then about four months into this pattern, I was at the bank and they, and they asked me my mom's maiden name and I had no idea. Yeah. And I just was like, I'm really messed up. And so I finally went back to that doctor and they did some blood work and she was like, I think like, you know, you're twitching, you're, you're shaking. She's like, I think we need to explore early onset Parkinson's and things like that. And so luckily I have an uncle who's a neurosurgeon Mm -hmm. and, and he was like, you don't have any of the symptoms. Like I would have seen it. And so that's when things kind of took another direction. And then they started to do, they did a a spinal tap and they found it immediately in my brain and my spine. And so basically I had babesiosis, um, Bartonella and then Lyme, Mm -hmm. and it was just chilling inside the brain, um, hanging out, hanging out. And then this is kind of where it gets dramatic. So Um, I go for a port placement and Mm -hmm. I don't know if the person wasn't well versed in tall women, but they collapsed my lungs on both sides. 
Um, and so for anyone that's actually listening, this is a really interesting fact to all people. Any woman over the height of like five, eight is considered tall in the medical field, I guess. Um, and your lungs actually go above your clavicles. And so oh. when you get a port placement, you need to get it strong through your neck and not here. And okay. so my uncle, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon, my mom called him and told him what happened. He was like, did he go to medical school? Like what is happening? <laughs> I can't believe it. And so he actually had to like file a complaint against it because he collapsed both of my, the lobes of my lungs. So I spent about seven days in the ICU dealing with that. And that was where things got buck wild because the doctor, the attending mm -hmm. at UW Madison, I'm calling you out, UW Madison, cardiothoracic floor, um, the attending, he reported my doctor who did the IV orders to the board of medical um, of Wisconsin and said that he was like doing some shady stuff and like he has, he has lost his license for that. And I, I felt like extremely guilty, even though I had nothing to do with it. Um, yeah. personally, like I wasn't like, Oh, cut my lungs. Like I want it, but yeah. it, it really hurt because I was the one that I don't know. I felt responsible for him losing his license anyway. So that like really tore up my, my heart. Um, because it made me realize how vulnerable all, all of these clinicians are, and even the ones that are like actively trying to help and going mm -hmm. about everything the right way, they're still subject to losing their license for doing, for treating the patient. And that's what medicine is, in my opinion, not treating on a protocol based on a blanket of symptoms. So that was what blew my mind, where it was like, this was the first doctor who treated me as like myself, as a human. And then this man who didn't even know me, who was mm -hmm. like, I don't know, just some random dude was like, what the hell? And just through this other, I don't know, it was a lack of compassion. It's something that I never had seen before. And that's when I think I like, I swear to God, I like broke in half. And I yeah. just like, I was like, this is it. And I was like, no one's gonna fight for me, except for myself. Yeah. And I'm, and I then was like, all right, I'm gonna find that underground network of doctors. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do what I can and we're going to break this healthcare system because we need to figure it out because it's so broken already that we need to break it to remake it ourselves to make it work for people. Um, I'm rambling. I'm sorry, but that's basically <laughs> my backstory um, to oh. it's intense. Um, uh I think it shows, unfortunately, what happened to that doctor and being reported shows the severe um, like lapse and lack of knowledge about tick-borne disease generally in the medical community, which is- But UW-Madison, you know, and that's where yeah. it blows my mind. It's like, okay, Wisconsin is known for their cutting edge research, but then we have this competitive edge in American science where- mm -hmm no one knows each other's research and until it's like blah 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 because they're competing for scholarship money because yeah. they don't have enough and that's how all of our research is funded in this country and it's like wait why is this not a why is why is this public information about my body and about all of my friends bodies yours to gain money off of so yeah. i don't know structurally something's wrong and how research is done in this country and that's another side note but that's what i thought about uw madison is what i found interesting is they're a research-based hospital and so it was very competitive mm -hmm. and no one was mm -hmm. talking to other doctors versus yeah. when i got into the mayo clinic it was a very open peer-to-peer -peer i don't even yes it was yeah. like i was i was a, a member at a table not like a weird person that was like heckling doctors to get attention from like the outside even though i was paying you know yeah. i was like hey look over here 
<laughs> yeah. And they're like, oh, I mean, give her some medicine. <laughs> no, it's hard. I mean, I know a doctor in Wisconsin. I don't think it's exclusive to Wisconsin. I hear about this quite frequently and like, I'm a healthcare publicist. And one of the things that I have to navigate with my clients that tackle tick-borne disease is what you can say and what you can't say, because people can get into so much trouble over things that now are like very mainstream and very well researched and peer reviewed. And it's horrible. And there, there's a doctor that I know and adore in Wisconsin um, that's very well known that served as the president of ILADS for a long time. And last year he got reported and I quote for ordering too much blood work on his patients because he had you know, all these patients like you and I coming to him that were like, I'm sick. I can't get a bed. I don't know what's wrong. Like, you know how it is with tick-borne disease, Lyme disease, Babesia, all I'm sorry, things. but and too much blood work? Like A nurse good? in a lab reported him to the state and she had a patient come in that, you know, got like 30 vials of blood or whatever it is that we all get, like when we're trying to figure out what the F is wrong with our bodies. And yeah, and she reported him. <laughs> yeah, I think like, literally two years later is like still fighting it. So it's, it's crazy, but I want to back up for a second. Cause I know, um, you and I were chatting earlier. It took, so you were bit when you were 23, you were finally diagnosed when you were 24. And in that mm -hmm. span, prior to being diagnosed with Lyme, you saw between 25 and 30 doctors. What was that like? Honestly, how did it no, was nobody be like oh maybe she has a tick-borne disease like that just is my that's what blew my mind my and life. that's that's what I think I had to say about research-based hospitals because I was seeing doctors that were working on they I was I I was a, just filling a void in their like clinical mm -hmm. journey that they had yeah. to do I don't think they cared about the patient they cared about their research and they and so that's I I, like when I would go in, I don't think I'm like made eye contact with people. Like, that's what I mean is like, and then the doctor would be like, I don't know what's wrong. And so then I would go back and see another physician in the same department. Yeah. And then I, they wouldn't understand. So then I would see an inter another internal medicine person. And then that internal medicine person would refer me to infectious diseases. Infectious diseases would refer, refer me to a specialist and Parkinson's neurology and then like they would bring a therapist in and I'm like uh, uh, honestly it made me like it made uh, it made me feel, doubt myself like yeah. um my, uh, like it goes back into the conversation we were having earlier about dating um mm -hmm. it's like I'm building up my my internal self-confidence again just because I was beat down by people that I was supposed to trust and that were supposed to look at me and see me as like a real person. And then I was like, wait, maybe I'm not having these symptoms. And it was such a mind, a mind game for me that like I applied that mind fuck to every part of my life where it was mm -hmm. like, am I good enough to like work? Am I good enough to date? And then I realized like, wow okay a respected member of the community telling me that my mind is messed up really does like take a toll on how you see yourself how you treat yourself how you really believe your worth is how you integrate or don't integrate into society and like i just find that fascinating that i was told so many times like i i i have anxiety like before i was diagnosed with Lyme, I had an anxiety disorder, like a pretty bad yeah. one. So it wasn't like new that I had an anxiety disorder. And I was like, therapist, I was like, I got two. Okay. Like, yeah, I do not have pain from this. All right. Like I woke yeah. up one day and I wasn't that I wasn't the same. And so yeah. that's why it's fascinating because like, I was telling them they had my records. They could see I, I, I was seeing doctors and yet the words that were coming out of my mouth were not hitting in the brain. And I was like, is this hysterical women's syndrome? Are we in the twenties yeah. where like, I need to be put into like a room with other crying women? Like what is happening in this world? So I think that was a lot of what my internal dialogue was like, am I nuts? And then I would research on forums at the time. It was a lot of Reddit 
and like yeah. Tumblr and like early, I, I don't even know if Facebook had early resources at that time. Yeah, which was like weird internet archives um, and not the most like great places. I don't even know, like weird blogs I was finding, like, you know, and comments on holistic blogs. And then I would find there, I would find a link and then I would find a doctor and then I would look at the doctor's research and then, you know, and yeah, it was like my, I had like, yeah, anyway. So I was researching my doctor's research, trying to research and figure out <laughs> what research to research. <laughs> it's like a constant, just never ending circle. Like a it dog felt like chasing its tail. I was trying tail. to solve a crime with like, you know, like string yeah. and like an FBI wall. We and need to get like, okay, your own like crime podcast. Start like yeah, solving murders, like, except it's just born disease research symptoms honestly you could do it's, it you'd be so good at it i would listen to that in about two seconds what's so funny is um i've diagnosed two of my assistants with correct problems i was like my one assistant i was like you have hashimoto's 100 percent he has hashimoto's like oh and God. and like well just based on like his symptoms and i was diagnosed with everything and misdiagnosed with everything and so like you just catalog that well, and someday when you sell Floris Lane for millions and millions of dollars, can you please go get like your doctor? I'm gonna have a game show. A doctor. <laughs> oh my god! Because <laughs> it's America. That's not where I no was going health. with this, but that's fine. No, that's I'm fine. gonna give healthcare away for free. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I'm good with that too. Can you just be like the next AOC, maybe? Like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. I'll brand you. It'll be fine. You might yeah. lose if I run your campaign, but it's all good. No, we'll get we there together. We win at life. That's the key. We're winning at life. We're losing in politics, but winning at life. That's so, not to get ahead of ourselves. You lose <laughs> politics, you win at life. <laughs> new new um, tagline for everybody. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> um, okay, to back up again for a minute, I want to hear about. So it took you a year to get diagnosed. You saw between twenty five and thirty doctors. God bless. What was your I guess like what was your diagnostic journey like like was it blood work how much blood work like what was that journey like to actually receive the confirmation I know you said you did a spinal tap and that's mm, how they found it, was, it and did doctors like accept that as your diagnosis right away what was wild is um I remember exactly where I was when I got the call because I was relieved because I was like there's something wrong thank god yeah and um yeah. And the doctor, they ran three tests to make sure it was Lyme. And they're like, it was lighting up like a Christmas tree. Like it was, there was no way that it wasn't, but they tested it three times, which I thought was kind of odd. And they said, yeah. it's routine to do that. And I was like, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I honestly think they were skeptical at first, but the fact that okay. it kept coming back positive, um, they were like, well, she's got it, man. So yeah. that's when things turned very serious. And okay. they were like, oh, okay, so now we need these sets of medicines to treat this. We need these mm -hmm. sets to treat this and these sets to treat this. Yeah. We need these to interact with your medications. And so then it was just a conversation of, what medicines are we switching? What are we doing orally? What are we putting through the IV? How are we detoxing you? And then how do we set up your home care? How do we get a pick line in you? How do we get you to stop moving around like a crazy person? Um, <laughs> cause like I was trying to work and cause like I was side note, I refused to move home during this entire thing oh my because God. like, I don't know. Living with my mom, I was like, mom, I'd rather die. And she's like, yeah, I can tell. Um, <laughs> I was like, not no, dramatic at all. Yeah, I know. I was like, no, I'd rather die than move home. She's like, yeah, no, literally you were like, are pretty close. And I was like, yeah, like, I'm not, I'm going to go out here. So I <laughs> lived go out with in, thing. yeah, I lived by my, I, well, I lived with my roommate in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and my family's from Cincinnati. And so about eight hours away. 
And okay. so I was completely alone. Um, so I was like, found a home care nurse that I liked and a, a series of people, nurses that I trusted that would come, you know, every other day to help me with my bandages. Um, and basically, I came up with a nice regiment with my case manager. So I would see her pretty much. I mean, we would talk every week, yeah. um, almost every day, honestly, because yeah. at first I was like having trouble regulating my drip rates and yeah. understanding, you know, how it is. And yeah. you screw up a lot at first, and then you're not yeah. sure like what's normal and and as that progressed, I was like, meh. And so then I would go almost a full month without talking to her. And she's like, hey, we need to schedule. Like, it's been three weeks. And I'm like, oh, hey, yeah, I'm at? good. Because, <laughs> like, I knew my plan, you know? And, yeah. like, I'd be, and so, like, I even knew, like, what was coming after that. And the pharmacist was already prepping me for that. And so okay. I, I had really a great support system once. I was able to put those pieces together, but I did yeah. it myself, 100% alone myself. And that's why I advocate for yeah. anyone because like, I mean, I'll randomly text you and email you if I can't find someone, a doctor in the Midwest where yeah. I'm like, help me. <laughs> Cause like, oh my God, I'm I, always, you know. Well, I just didn't help. have anyone to call. I had yeah. no one. And so, even just like being that person, like I commented on Amy Schumer's um, Lyme disease thing. And yeah. even to this day, I still have people DMing me from that post. Oh yeah. And Cause I think she pinned it at the top and it was like, hit me up. Like if you're scared or like something very normal, like been there, like, yeah, I'm been on there. the other side, like Come chat hit with me, me up. <laughs> well, that's why I love you though. Cause you are I mean, you are absolutely inspirational, but just your attitude towards your journey with tick-borne disease and Lyme disease and what a badass you are and how much you help and encourage others and your outlook and your attitude is something that I think we so direly need within this community. Hmm. Um, that's why like anytime I do an event for like global Lyme lines or whatever, I'm like, Trish, Trish, you have to do this. Well, you have to do yeah, this. I, so. I think um, <laughs> we need more people that are I, I see, like, I consider myself well and healthy, but like, again, it, for me, it's a constant, it's not linear in the sense of like today, I technically am having a bad day. Like yeah. I took a shower this morning when I woke up and I usually don't do it right when I wake up. And I like, I yeah. think I detox too fast and I threw up. And so like, okay, it's just, but it's just like part of my new body and who I am and how I function and I, I accept it. And I just, I, it's me. And it's like, now what it, my body's a little sensitive and like, but that's okay. I mean, yeah. there are people that have weird problems and like, that's Man, okay. Just doesn't because have a weird problem. Like, honestly, give it, me a break. Everybody has weird problems, but even if they don't have Lyme. <laughs> And what's fascinating is um, I went on a date the other day with a guy who I really enjoy. I've met him over a year ago and he was the first person who like, didn't make me feel weird about having Lyme, but he said something really powerful to me. And he was like, cause um, he had issues with drugs and okay. he was like, I chose that. And I was like, no, you didn't. And he's like, no, but like, I, I indulged in it, you know, like, and I went and partied yeah. and I went and drank. He's like, what's crazy is like, you didn't choose this bug bite. And then all this crazy stuff happened to you. And he's like, and you're still so pleasant and happy. And I'm like, but like, I made it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm one of the few people in my community that can easily be like, I am okay. I am healthy and I'm, yeah. I'm functioning. And so that's why I feel like I need to be as loud as I humanly possibly can. And that's why I like, I'm always like me, I'll do it, you know, for whatever, because well, never again, stop, one person, please. yeah, one person is all we need to just, you know, break through and it's fine. Well, so, well, I would never wish Lyme disease on anyone, especially not you, but I am glad that you ended up not living the typical midwestern dream which i can't even 
picture for you because you and I, I are so similar and I can't picture that for myself. Um, so it's just like, so funny to think about you like that because you're just like, you know, the CEO, CEO and founder of like this cool company and like you do all this cool shit and like we talk about wormholes and dating and time travel and whatever and like Matt's probably over there banging his head into his computer. Um, but that's okay. We're going to keep going anyway. For those that can't um, see me visually, I just want to say that I, I am laughing hysterically over here. And a couple of times I snorted left, like embarrassingly snorted left. So I just want to share that with the <laughs> listeners because they can't see my reaction like you both can. So. <laughs> oh my God. It's just so funny because like, I wouldn't change a single moment of any of it. It sucked, but I wouldn't change anything. Nothing. Not even like oh. my weird lung collapsing because well I, I would maybe change that for you. We can do no, it though, because I got collapse. to learn some crazy things. Okay, no, you know? no more lung collapsing, please. Knock wood. I know I'm done with that one. I'm Putting the good energy the up to whoever is out there. But no like, more collapsed lungs. I just I learned though, you know, and I learned the maliciousness of the inner system doctors, you know, and I learned how to advocate myself while on morphine, <laughs> like you know, and. <laughs> And I, I You're learned like, so many, Trisha. <laughs> no, I actually was fierce as hell. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> like I, was, I had no feelings. So I was like, yeah, what? who knew all you need was a little morphine drip. <laughs> to, like, Is that the key? That's the yeah, key. too bad that you can only have it in clinical settings. Yeah. But like I, <laughs> I was like strung out on morphine to collapse lungs and completely telling this doctor off. I yeah. was like not having it because he wouldn't right. give me antibiotics either. And I was like, after all this, you're still not going to give me antibiotics because I was already on orals. Yeah. Still, they could do that because it was, it's a, de a big deal. And yeah. I was like, literally like, what's good. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> Just take care of this. So I don't have to suffer any longer. I was like, I'm about to smuggle drugs in here that are completely prescribed to me. Yeah. Cool. I told him that I said it exactly like that. And he was, and then I got them. And then the infectious disease clinic actually came over to talk to me about Lyme disease. Oh my gosh. And, and I literally was like, I went like that. I like shooed her out with my hand. It was the most rude thing I've ever done to anyone in my life. I'm telling you, well, I was drunk. You gotta up. get mad to get what you need though. Like that's the sad, that's the sad that, thing. My I doctor, told you I broke in half like I was like oh this is how it is yeah and it was yeah and yeah it was not good so well that's why I'm happy we have you as a loud proud advocate because I just need you to tell more people off that don't believe um it's unreal so we heard about your midwestern dream that ended up not happening but honestly, <laughs> in my opinion that was probably for the best for the better I don't know if that would have really worked out long term anyway. Mm -mm. I don't know. Um, we talked about your symptoms, talked about your diagnostic journey, 25 to 30 doctors you saw, which is insane, but I think unfortunately not too far from reality for most people and listeners. Yeah. Um, and now I am like maybe going to let Matt get like just one word in. So I'm going to throw it to Matt for a little bit and we will resume. So for the record, I have to say, Ali, if you were rich, I would have interrupted him 20 minutes ago. Just so you know, because there's so much I wanted to contribute, but it was so brilliant that I'm like, all right, I'm just going to step back and let this gold continue to happen. You could have interrupted us. We would have yeah, let you have one. I would have just ruined one. it. So I, I, I didn't want to ruin it. You guys, you guys had a flow going there. But I, I there's so I have I literally have pages of notes here already all over the place. But what I, my takeaway is, Trish, is that you mentioned that you always questioned yourself and that you know mm -hmm. you you started to believe, well, maybe I'm not sick. Maybe it's in my head. I have medical professionals telling me that. And, you, and then you went on to say that you're one of the lucky ones, but I wanna challenge you on that because I, yes, I agree that you are, are successful and you've had a positive outcome, but I think that's because of, of patterns you developed. And we so we like to identify patterns for success with Lyme disease and tick-borne illness. And other people that we've interacted with in the community haven't done what you've done. So you said that you are okay, you are healthy and you are functioning. And then you said that you had to learn how to advocate for yourself and you had to learn how to deal with these vicious medical professionals who were, who were essentially dismissing you. And if you didn't do all those things, you wouldn't be where you are today. And that's why I'm challenging you to say, was it really luck or was it your perseverance and persistence that got you to where you are today? Um, it's so funny. Um, 
I have this saying with my mom because like I have a four leaf clover tattooed on my foot because I'm my mom always says that like we're inherently unlucky and I always say that I am lucky because I push my luck because I push for it right and so um I I would say like I'm lucky because I think everything fell into place correctly but I I also refuse to accept my reality as a sick person I was like this is not my story this is not what i intend to be this is this is not how i had it planned out in my head and i was like it's going to not be this way <laughs> and i just like that was it and it was how who can i get in my corner that's going to believe that as well and but you just said it you you refuse to let the sickness become your identity and you would not be a sick yes. person and there are other people who have accepted their fate as a sick person and they don't get better. So how did you get to that point where you said, I'm going to continue to fight and I'm not going to give up? Because I think a lot of us need some motivation here because of, of all of the, the medical negligence we faced and, and the medical abuse we faced. How did you overcome that and continue to fight and not just say, I'm so sick, I'm just going to accept what this is because I, I don't think I can get any better? Well, you can accept your, that you're sick but it's not the only thing that you are you know what i mean and that's what i think is part of the most important piece like so for example like say you get the flu right or like whatever it, it okay yeah you do have that or like mono you know it's like okay you have mono forever but you don't meet someone and you're like, Hey, I'm Trish. I have mono. And you're like, no, it just is part of like your, your medical story. And it's part of who you are. And it's just something you deal with. And so for me, I've like compartmentalized that in my mind where it's like, I'm Trish. I have so many other pieces to my identity that Lyme is just one of them. And I try not to let it be my dominant one because that's not how I want my story to go. And like, I constantly am redirecting myself because I have bad days, you know, like whatever and or tired days or tired weeks like I got the vaccine and you know and it was about a month of being a sick person I felt like but I was like okay Trish you have one day of wallowing and self care and then feeling sorry for yourself but then you're going to go to bed you're going to wake up and cut the shit and then like, but then it would be like, okay, what do I need though to feel like I can function? And I realized that for me, self-care is, is bar none what I need to function. So like self-care is different for everyone else. So you need to figure out what your self-care love language is. And that's the most important thing because everyone's like, self-care is like a book or a bath. Well, I don't like taking baths in my bathroom. I think it's gross. So, but self-care to me is actually going to a yoga class, laying on my acupressure mat for half an hour, listening to music, but like also going on my like roller or taking a walk, volunteering in my library, repotting my plants, like, and all of those things I say like get me high they like give me small amounts of joy and then like the biggest piece is also connecting with other Lyme people too and talking with other Lyme people because like we all are so cool and the thing that it connected us is something bad but it does not again define why we all are still hanging out and being friends because like it's like oh cool you have line but you're also dope as hell so like it's not like what i'm thinking about when i'm talking and so it's like we need to realize that like oh my god we have lives before after and during this illness and because our symptoms are taking over our our immediate reality it doesn't mean it actually has to take over our actual identity. Does that make sense? It does. So Trish, I want to focus more on, on, on expanding it a little bit and, and integrating that with what you did to treat and what you're still doing. So when you said that 
you wake up and you say, okay, cut the shit, you had your day of wallowing, you didn't mean just fight through it. You meant that you had to use your self-care tools that you've developed, that you've personalized, that you know work for Trish. Yeah. And that includes things for your mental health, for your physical health, sleeping, and, and things that, that will allow you to, to ease back into your normal life. It's not just waking yep. up and saying, cut the shit, I'm gonna feel better. It's actually a whole no. tool set of things that get you to the place where yeah. you need to be to be and physically well again. Yeah, and I think that's where the most important piece is understanding what's gonna get you to that moment of like, cut the shit, I can handle it now. And so for me, now I got it down to like one day of rest. Before it would be four days you know, of like, okay, I need to take a weekend and I need to go and sit in a, a Korean spa for like eight hours and then an infrared sauna. And I need to do hot yoga for like three days in a row. And I need to sleep 12 hours. I have days or weeks like that still. And, um, when I got the vaccine, that's what I did. I was like planning for five days of just nothing, but self-care is what I'll call it. I hate that word of like rehab, rehabbing my body and making sure I have what I need and juices and like, I mean, everything. I, I even use like compression blankets and like, you know, and. But all the little things me, add up and they help together collectively. So one little thing may seem so insignificant when you say it, but it's collectively the impact they all have together to help you feel better. Yeah, curate your your road trip is kind of like how I like to say it in short form is like, you know, when you're packing for a road trip, you think of all the things that you're going to need if you're bored and like whatever. And so like you try to get them packed. And so like you're not feeling well, you know, you're not going to like want to run to Walgreens and want to do all this. So like get all the stuff that you need to help yourself feel better. You don't have to feel like crap. You know, like no one's telling you just because you have this pain that you have to ha accept that it's like that. And so like for, oh. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. For, no, no, I just wanted to ask you because I, I wanted to just bounce back a little bit because I know you touched on that when you first got diagnosed, you you treated with, what, what was your treatment protocol that got you to where you are today? Was, I think you said it was IV antibiotics, oral antibiotics. Yeah. A pretty heavy detox an, protocol and some ozone therapy, right? Um. Yeah, it was all at different times though, not at the same time. The detox protocol was with the IV antibiotics. Um, so I did that for about two years and then I got off the antibiotics um, and did orals so that like my immune system didn't totally collapse. And so then once I, we started tapering off the antibiotics to see how I was doing, I was still having weird like, I don't even want to uh, post Lyme disease things like flaring joint pain. I, I was not in control of my body at all. And I felt like it was like, ah, and, um, I was like poking holes in a sinking ship, if that makes sense. Um, and so my doctor was like, let's try to do ozone therapy, high dose. And this was three years ago. Um, and so it really wasn't a thing then. And, um, so it was actually just, she was studying from a guy in Germany. Um, I don't know the doctor's name. Um, and so she was going over there and studying with him and doing like clinicals. And then basically when she, um, my doctor, she understood how to do it in a clinical setting, the doctor that she's studying with helped set up the clinic over here. And so I was patient zero for them. <laughs> and so what I did was um, I was doing low dose ozone therapy just to get my body to see how it work and like not, you know, make sure my body wasn't gonna freak out. And then, um, so I don't, are you familiar with high dose ozone? Yeah, but so I know there's so many different forms of ozone. So can you just explain what kind you got? Yeah, I was about to, Okay, yeah, perfect. I was going to exp I was I I was going to go into it and then I was like, "Wait, should I?" Um okay, so basically I was hooked up to an IV in the doctor's office. And so this I the IV was attached to so okay, I'm going to give you a visual. Follow me here. So it was hanging like from an IV pole. Um I was on one end 
there was an egg in the middle, like on the IV pole. And then there was like a green box on the other end. And so that was connecting, we were all connected. So the green box actually had the ozone. And so what would happen is they would pull suction out the blood, fill the egg three quarters, and then push the ozone in, swirl the egg, my blood would turn like super bright red and then they would push it back in. And then what was crazy is there'd be like weird chunks of whatever and whatever. And they were saying it was exploding. Like it was like um, virus, you know, and they actually tested it. And there was like everything from like lime, uh, metals, um, interesting Teflon um they found teflon in there too but that's a side story um so yeah basically it i did that and so a high dose session is about 10 of those pushes okay and so uh i i believe 10 of those pushes is about three quarters of your blood cycling through in your body so then the other quarter is cleaned by those fresh blood cells. And so basically I did that every day for a month and I would go in for four hours ish. It got easier. My body got used to it. And then I also realized like if I was well hydrated and like, um, I ate before I went in, um, um, like it would help the session go faster. So then I did it, I did it every day for a month and then I did it three times a week for a month. And then I did it once a week for a month and then never again. So it was a total of three months, but you sort of gradually went off it, it sounds like. Yep. So and, I'm yeah. sorry, I just want to make a quick observation. So what we were talking about earlier, I know we're kind of bouncing around chronologically here. So when we talked about your, your self-care and your toolkit, that's for you today when you're in a much better place in a, in a healed place, I'll call it. But yeah. you were really sick. You were, you, you had severe neurological symptoms that developed oh, before I you got diagnosed. Oh, I was sick, sick. Yeah, I was not well. Um, As you noted, your mother I, said that you were close to death at one point, it sounds like. Yeah, um, I'm like, I, it's, it's hard for me to like even describe it. Um, like, I mean, when I, I was, <laughs> I was given my last rites um, at the hospital, like when my lungs were collapsed, um, just because I mean, it was not good. Like I, I was sick, you know, and um, it's just interesting because I hid that from my family and I hid it from everyone because I didn't want to accept it. But yeah, I was um, very unwell and um, I was, I don't, I like, I was pretty much like throwing up bed bound couch bound um i like to describe it as like so when i moved to la i could walk down to the end of my block which is like 500 feet um and i would get tired and lightheaded um and then let's see that that was about 10 eight nine years ago and now i can walk miles and miles and miles but to give you an idea i would benchmark my health on based on like how far i could walk in my neighborhood and so like it, it took me a long time to be able to even walk down like a half mile you know and so um yeah it, it i like yes i'm 100 i'm like 90 percent better i'm 90 yeah 95 percent better like when I'm on good days. I think you're 110% um, better, but that's just me. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like I, it, it was a daily process to get there. And daily benchmarks, daily trying. Every day I was trying so hard. <laughs> and it was a slow process that you had to you had to work at. And I and I the reason I asked you that question is because so many people listen to this podcast and think, well. Trish, there's no way she was as sick as I am or was, but you were. Oh gosh. And and, and the point yeah. of me highlighting this is is people should have hope and you're an inspiration oh my God. story because you were bedbound. You were given oh the last rights to the hospital. You did all this treatment 
and now you're you're living a normal life again. And when you have yeah. some bad days, you have just some, some basic tool tool sets that help you bounce back relatively quickly within a day, you said, which is really, really powerful and inspirational from, from my standpoint. And I think what's so interesting about your treatment protocol is you hit it hard and, and you treat it with, I think, NYU, you said, right? With these, the, in the beginning? Yeah, the original protocol was, oh, I forget his name, but he's so cute and he died of Lyme disease recently. Um, I, I can send it to you. Um, I have it on my computer, but yeah, it was a protocol out of NYU is the one we followed. It was the original. So, so it, I think, and I'm curious to see if you agree with the statement that you hit it pretty hard with your IV antibiotics which did a, yes. a, a pretty pretty aggressive kill-off protocol from the various tick-borne illnesses, not just the Lyme bacteria, all the co-infections and other things mm -hmm. you could have picked up as well, but you, you also coupled that with a, with a pretty aggressive detox protocol because we know that's really yes. important at the time. Then you followed up with oral antibiotics and you, then you still felt like you said, you still weren't right. And I think that's because we know ticks fit so many things into us and we harbor things as you know it like, like mono and the Epstein-Barr virus that aren't really from, yep. from a tick bite. But when we get so chronically ill, those things reactivate and we have to address them. So when yep. you did, and I really appreciate the visual you gave us. So when you did the, the ozone blood therapy that you did, all the stuff that got reactivated and the things that weren't addressed by the antibiotics from a bacterial standpoint, you kind of kick their ass with the ozone. And you mentioned you actually saw things yep. in, that, in that little egg shape that were viruses heavy metals, you mentioned Teflon, right? So I think that was a final piece of your, of your healing puzzle that you had to get through to get yourself and your body in a place to be able to rebound and get back to your normal, healthy, healthy state. That exactly. It was so I think it's a really good model for people to follow. And we, I always look at this from what's a good shortcut or a hack for people listening. And in, in many cases like mine and like yours, antibiotics alone may not be enough because we have so many other things going on that we have to, we have to address. And clearly you did that. Is that something that you would agree with that? It's not just Absolutely. the line. It was really so much more. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, it was, um, detoxification and treating, right. And that's why I always emphasize treat the patient and the disease because the disease is, is, okay, it's going to follow a certain type of protocol, right? But the patient is not the disease. And we have all these different pre-existing genetic factors, Yes, you know, and my body doesn't produce enough glutathione. Who knew? And so like they were giving me pushes of glutathione every day though. And so that, like, as soon as we started the, the detoxification protocol, that amplified my treatment by like, I felt like I was getting better like day over day. And, but for me, again, I was brutally honest with my doctors. I was like, I feel like shit. And I would just straight up be like, I don't want to, I, this isn't working. I'm plateauing. Like, what do I do? And I, I constantly was challenging them and I didn't make, I, and again, you don't have to settle for your reality. And that's what I like, I want to impress upon people. There's so much you can do. And so even after I got through my um, um, ozone treatment, my Epstein-Barr, my mom had mono when she was pregnant with me. So I got it from birth. And so I didn't even know I had it. And so they were like, your Epstein-Barr is insane. Your vitamin D levels are so low. I had, is it scurvy? No, whatever it is, like the pirate thing. Yes. My vitamin D level was like four and it's supposed to be like in like the eighties. So that was like a huge thing. And then they found out that I had candida and that my body wasn't able to absorb vitamins. Um, and so all of this was just left over, like kind of just like bullshit from Lyme and antibiotics. And so now for me, it's a constant readjustment of understanding of like diets and understanding like, okay, this is going to make me tired if I have too much sugar, or I need to make sure I'm on probiotics every single day, which everyone should be that's listening to this. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, like, I, I guess, so, can I interrupt again? I, so would you recommend, yeah. I'm sorry, I just, I, I don't want to lose these thoughts. And I think you have so much powerful information. Would you recommend to every line patient listening to this, that they ask for a full blood panel of, of essentially everything, vitamins, you name it, and potential genetic deficiencies. Because Genetics, in your case yes. and in my case, I think that was so important to know those pieces of the puzzle to, to address them. Because in many cases, those things can actually prevent you from healing from Lyme or there are things that have yes. to be addressed in parallel because 
your body was managing them until they couldn't. And now you have to address them in parallel to Lyme. So I think that's a really important takeaway is don't just continue to do Lyme tests. You want to look at everything and take a whole body approach for, from a viral standpoint, yeah. from a heavy metal standpoint, from a, you know, how how important vitamin D is, right? All those types of things. And you mentioned that your body wasn't, wasn't generating enough glutathione, super important to detox and for, from, from a, an antioxidant standpoint. So, you know, is that something you'd recommend to people? And if so, what type of testing would you recommend for that? So, um, like I, I get regular, you know, standard blood work every six months. And then annually, my doctor and I will do a full panel where she orders, um, basically like my vitamins, um, all of like my Epstein bar, my, she'll even do like Lyme tests just to see where we're at and like all of that. But then, um, every, I think every three years she does the genetic one, but I guess it was two. Well, whatever. It doesn't matter. Cause like I'm what well, I tested on the borderline of celiac. And so that's why we did the genetic test. And I actually came back celiac this year. Um, and so like, I had a couple of weird family genetic things that came out to play. Um, and that's what I want everyone to understand too. Like your body again is separate from Lyme. And I want you to, I know it takes over your thinking a lot, but your body is still an independent vehicle that has feelings and needs and has things that it need to be addressed. Like going to the eye doctor, you know, like you need to do that or go to the dentist, you know? Um, and so like, just keep going. It's okay. Like, and so holistic approach is how I, I approach everything in life but that way. But, um, I, I looked at my body and was like, okay, I think there's something going on in how I'm, I'm absorbing nutrients or not. And I talked to my doctor about it and she's like, we, let's get to the bottom of it. And so we did, we just pulled blood and looked at everything. And we just kind of were like, all right, we think it's candida causing the malabsorption and, and vitamin D is used um, in healing for antibiotics, um, as a catalyst and also for vitamin B. And, um, basically we were able to put together why I was feeling certain things now, because it was so easy. Cause I got rid of a whole bunch of other crap. And so what I'm saying is like, you know, how your symptoms are unmanageable. There's so many, but like, honestly, if, if you take them, at holistically and look at how maybe some are connected, you can start eliminating large chunks of them at once. It's kind of crazy. And I think what you just described is a really powerful statement for people that say that come out and say all the time, I treated with IV antibiotics and so did you Trish, but I didn't feel better. Well, that wasn't the magic bullet. There is no magic bullet for Lyme. You had to mm -hmm. then go on even further and find out individually how are you genetically different than everybody else? And how is your body just different in general from everybody else? And even as you noted, what did you get congenitally? Like you mentioned that you, you, you carried on Epstein-Barr from your mom congenitally, right? All those things had to be looked at. So if people are listening and they have a positive diagnosis or a tick-borne illness and they've done a lot of treatment, they're not feeling better, I think it's important to maybe see some sort of naturopathic doctor or a doctor who's willing to look at your body as a whole to see what else is going on in the big picture to address those things like candida, which can prevent you from healing from Lyme, right? So I think that's a really, yeah. really important takeaway here for people that have given up to, to go back at it and look for, look for other reasons as to why they may not be healing. And what's fascinating is like, even I was, I'm, I'm healthy guys. Like I, and I still even complained to my doctor. I was like, you know, like I'm still kind of tired and I just feel like not as great as I probably should, even though I'm healthy, I'm still bitching. And she was like, let's do tests like fun. And that's how I found out my vitamin D levels were so low and I have candida. And I was like, told you. <laughs> and it's like really interesting because now I'm on a probiotic regimen and I've been on it for a while. And I actually feel insanely better than like, I'm sleep. I'm like forcing myself to go to bed at night, like a child, because I have so much energy now. And so it's like, I, <laughs> I had a moment the other day where I cried because I felt so good. And I was like, Oh my God. And it's just like, I, I'll never get over being alive and feeling this good because like, 
I swear to God on your bad days, you can visualize this feeling because it's not too far away, even though time seems so long when you're sick, but like when you're on the other side of it, even just chunks of the other side, you know what I mean? When you get to look back and you're like, wow, I'm so much better than I was a year ago. And that's how I look at it now. And I just get so proud of myself because it's like, I didn't give up and I'm still not giving up. And it's like a constant check-in conversation, which I feel like is very important. And I feel like people don't do that a lot and being really honest with yourself. So I have a two-part question before handing it back to Allie to talk about your beautiful transformation that you've made since you've gotten better, like your, your Floris Lane company, which is <laughs> off the hook, by the way, we, we love you. And, and, and it's well needed for, for everybody, not just sick people. So the, the two-part question is, what are you doing today to maintain your health? Because clearly you've been doing very well and you've been staying in that place. And the second part is what advice would you give to people that are in the throes of it? If, if you had to look back at yourself when you were at your worst, what would you tell yourself? Okay. One, I'm going to start with the hard question. What would I, what would I tell people? Um, I would say find a doctor that you feel comfortable talking to as a friend, telling the bad shit to the dirty, like gross, because that's how you'll get the best treatment or a series of nurses. Like my doctor's office, my nurses, like I'm friends with on Instagram. Like, and like, sometimes I won't even call the office. I'll just DM them and be like, I'm coming in for an immune drip, you know, like whatever. And so for me, it was creating a community of doctors and nurses and practitioners that I could rely on to see me and be like, this is not, I'm not good. I'm unwell. I need help. And they'll know when I'm unwell because they know me and they trust me. And so that was a constant that's my advice is to find a group of healers, whether it be what you're comfortable with, natural paths, you know, whatever your comfort level is, or if you don't even know what your comfort level is, I think you need to start somewhere and then find out what you like and what you don't like. Um, and then for me, for ongoing stuff, I, I am constantly like doing like IV drips and like, I don't know. I, I, I have pressed juice every day that has vitamin B in it that has, um, glutathione. Um, and so I actively kick it every day. Like it, it's a constant choice to eat clean, to live clean. I don't like do any weird things, but then I also like, will be very honest with myself and be like, Hey, we're not feeling so great. We need to go in and check in and get a drip or figure out like what's going on. And so then I'll go in and I'll sign up, I'll talk to them about an immune drip. And then I'm like, but I'm also like feeling like X, Y, and Z. And they'll be like, Hmm, maybe we should hang, um, an immunoglobin bag too. And then I'll be like, okay. And so it, had I not said that they wouldn't have known. And so I honest, be honest with yourself and be honest with your people that you trust, their practitioners. And if you need help finding them, we can help you find them. We're around. There's enough of us now, sadly, that like we're, we're getting into, we're getting organized, <laughs> you know? And it's like, i um, as soon as, as soon as I have a studio, I mean, I'm going to be having events all the time and I'm going to have a resource place and like, I have, um, I'm going to set up a suite for like infusions and stuff like that, where my nurses who have helped me are going to actually be able to do ozone therapy and immune infusions at my studio. And so I just want to create a place that like, sorry, also for the beeping. Um, I wanted to create a place that like people, if all fails, they can be like, okay, I can go here. I can walk in and someone's going to be like, I can help you because like, I didn't have that. Cause like, I would walk into hospitals and people would be like, what do we do with you? And I'd be, you know what I mean? They'd be like, should we put you in the psych ward or infectious diseases or like both, you know? And so like, there's nowhere in the world like that right now. And so I, if I can be the first, I, I want to be the first. 
Trish, I have, I know I said I was done, but I have one, I want to make a fun twist to this here for both you and Allie, this question. So something that I often debate with other people in the community is, is something that I think a lot of people feel very strongly about. Some people say that even once you're feeling better, it's okay to go and do something that you know is going to have a negative impact on you. For example, to go and have that cheesecake, even though you know you're allergic to everything in it, or it's okay to not sleep for an entire night because you, it, it, that's part, that's, that's self-care, quote unquote. And I don't know my opinion, but I'm curious what both you and Ali think about that, about that concept is, is, a, is your lifestyle now different permanently because of, of what you realized from, from your illness, or do you still have to splurge at times to, to be able to, to get through life and, and just deal with the consequences of it? And I know it's a weird question. No, and people feel very strongly idea. about it, but where do you stand in, with that, with that topic? <laughs> I don't cheat on my diet at all. Um, because I don't have time for that. Like I get sick and I respect my time so much more now. And I respect my body and I respect myself that like cheating is so dumb that I'm like, Oh, I don't have time for it. I really don't. And also I find it disrespectful to myself. I know that sounds really weird, but like I've worked so hard to be where I am. And like, I kind of get mad when like waiters like mess up my orders and I get sick or like, you know, or, and so I, I don't have cheat days. My version of cheat days would be staying up late and like, um, like watching something I really want to watch or like, um, I'll stay up late and like do weird. I have like, um, I'm really interested in photos and like weird things online. And as, as you know, Allie, I just like <laughs> love finding weird shit on the internet. And so like my weird thing is I have this app that aggregates all the things that have been liked over the internet interwebs throughout the entire day. And so like, I love going through that image aggregator app and I could spend hours in there. And so that's like my version of self-indulgence and it's like not hurting anyone, you know, it's just, I don't know. And so that's, what's healthy for me, um, is I found another redirected, I redirected my need for like cheat days into something that won't harm me long-term. <laughs> Can you send me the information for that aggregator? No, I'm like, oh my God, you're thing. Yeah, send it to me too. You're please. never going to get off of it. Yeah. We'll have to, we'll actually have to drop it on the show notes for everybody listening. Because I'm sure everybody's going to want to know now. So we'll have to yeah. share it with the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Korean app, you guys. I've been using it for like 10 years. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so excited for this. I know what I'm doing tonight when I can't sleep. I, did I ever think I'd be looking at a Korean app that does like internet aggregation? No, but like stranger things have happened. We lived through 2020. You know, oh, it's my life. <laughs> really, my life. <laughs> oh, Trish, this is why I love you. Do you wait? I want to know. Do you cheat on your cheat days? You didn't answer the question. Um, I don't cheat very often. This for me is like a two-part question. Like number one, I just feel like if you're somebody where like you love food or like whatever it is, like you love fancy cocktails or wine or like whatever. And like, who am I to tell you? Like you shouldn't cheat. Like if that's what you look forward to and like, that's what keeps you sane, then by all means, like have that piece of cheesecake, just don't do it every day or every week or ever. You know what I mean? Like whatever it is. Um, yeah. I don't know. I just, I'm like, I don't judge anybody. Like you do you. I certainly have my own weird shit that I do. Like I shouldn't be telling anybody what to do. Although WebMD did email me yesterday and they were like, Dr. Moresco, we would love to promote you on WebMD. And I was like, kind of just like la laugh at it. And then like the salesperson like reached out to me on this morning. They're like, Dr. Moresco, we would love to promote you as like a top clinician in Chicago. And I literally emailed um, them back and I was I'm like, I am not it. a doctor. I like, it could have gone one of two ways. I like let her know I wasn't a doctor. So she would stop emailing me and calling me because I like don't even know how they got my phone number. Or I was like, maybe I should see how far I can take this. I would and see how they far actually I like do it. their research. Cause I'm like, you're just emailing like a random person online. I'm like, I'm certainly not a doctor. Thank God for everybody out there. Um, but yeah, so I'm like, I'm not a doctor. Like, I'm not going to tell you, you know what I mean? Oh my God. And I, I would have seen how far the rabbit hole went. So that's what I was debating. I was like, maybe I should do this. And I was like, I just don't really have time for that right now. And like, <laughs> I also like believe in karma. So I'm like, I don't need this coming back to bite me in the ass. 
um, I don't know, maybe I'll tell them you're a doctor, Trish, and I'll like refer them to you and then you can see how far you can take it. Um, I think that would be very fun. But I'm here for like, that. My version of cheating, like this sounds like very weird, but I think in America, like our food system is just so messed up and things are like so modified, like so inflammatory. Like for me, when I go to Europe, I can eat gluten and I have no reaction. Me too. No inflammation. I'm so, like, like eating baguettes, like a What's the thing? So, like, my version of cheating is, like, we order, like, semolina flour from Italy, and we'll, like, make something with it, because, like, it just, texturally, it just is so different. Like, I'm Italian. Like, sometimes it just has to happen, but it's not with, like, like, I'm not walking to McDonald's and getting, like, a cheeseburger. You know what I mean? Like, it's a different, I guess it's, like, a well-thought-out version of cheating, Um, and I don't do it very often, but... I love food. Like I can't help it. I like love food. My mom is like the best cook. So like when she pulls out like that semolina flour bag or like the pasta she imports from Italy, I'm like, yes, sign me up. Yes. Um, I don't know. So that's how I feel about it. Like teach their own. And like, if you eat a piece of cheesecake and can't get out of bed for a week, then yeah, you probably like, it's probably not worth it. But also like, who am I to judge you? Like I do my own weird stuff day in, day out. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's my thing. That's how I feel about it. I'm like, <laughs> I'm certainly weird enough. People don't, I don't know. I, like I do advice. weird stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on. Like, I don't know, name me like one person that's actually normal. Like, I don't think we could actually name anybody. So, I mean, I don't know anyone normal, but that's just me. No, I know. Same. Yeah. Like, I was talking to somebody yesterday and I was like, yeah, my two best friends, like one's a hypnotist, one's a medium. Like, what does that say about me? Like, I don't know. <laughs> oh my God. I need to be hypnotized. Like now. I'll call Chris Jones for you. Oh my um, God. So I always say, and I think Matt and Rich heard me say this when I did my first episode of Tick Boot Camp with them, like when you first started that lime, mm-hmm. while I would not wish it literally on my worst enemy, it made me a much better person. It made me realize what is actually important in life. It made me change my values. Um, all of these things. And I'm sure you were an amazing human before you got sick and you're still an amazing human now, just in different <laughs> ways. So I'm curious to know from you and in your lived experiences now with this disease, I guess, what part of your Lyme journey has been beautiful or encouraging? And like, what has it taught you about yourself and the world that like, unfortunately, only ex- only an experience like this can teach you and show you? Mm. I learned so much. And that's why I'm saying like, I can't change and take back anything what I've done because, yeah, um, you know, I, I learned a lot about healing obviously and how healing is like not a a, a, like a island that you go to and you're like healed you know it's like a constant vacation and trip and planning for it and like continuation a journey um and I think people think of it as the destination and it's it's not a destination it's a lifestyle and I feel like that's the most important thing I've learned but then also like I've learned how to live my life you know I when you're at a proximity to death where I was you find life so much more meaningful and you find yourself gravitating towards meaningful things because you look at other things people are doing and you're like my god that's how you're gonna spend your limited amount of time on this weird rock like okay And like, that's why I, I try to live every day, like so impactfully and so full and because time is our most valuable asset. And, uh, that is something I've really learned and I, I wouldn't change my time here for anything. And it's like, I don't know. Yeah. I feel like I'm rambling, but no, that. Yes, that's beautiful. Um, And that makes so much sense. And I'm totally with you. I'm like, if I'm going to be here, I'm going to live my life and I'm going to live it to the fullest and I'm going to enjoy every single moment. I'm going to use it to help others. And 
feel like that's why you and like Matt and I really connect and yeah I have less time for bullshit yeah like and I'm kind of like totally I with my business I even have even less time for bullshit and it's like I I just don't do it and I that's something yeah I've carried over and I feel like people that don't value health um Mm -hmm. they don't really have a part of my life you know because I mean they don't value my journey and like I I look at the vaccination thing right now that's happening and um what's fascinating is I had a conversation with a friend of mine whose father's a surgeon um Mm -hmm. and he's an anti-vaxxer and I was like you know I was like I find it fascinating that your life is paid for by science and Mm -hmm. you're poo-pooing it like you don't like you weren't an AP bio with me and he was like you know like I think he brought it guns into the situation and I found it fascinating because he believes a gun is his right to safety and I was Mm -hmm. like how is this any different than my right to safety and having a vaccine I think I need a vaccine to feel safe and you think you need a gun and I respect your right so respect mine and so I feel like healthcare is a new a new right that people are starting to understand in this country because we got our first shots free and people were like holy crap wait that was really easy why yeah what and so then there were I think we're at the beginning of something and I think the vaccine anti-vaxxer movement is the resistance to the change. And so, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, rambling again. No, we need, we need change in so many different areas. And, you know, I was facilitating an interview for a client yesterday and I just found it astounding that over 31% of people that were hospitalized with COVID are now permanently disabled or suffer from a long-term chronic condition, 31, it was like 31.3%, I believe. So something has to change because that is a massive amount of people to become disabled or chronically ill essentially overnight that now we're going to need accommodations. But that's why we need to figure this shit out. And that's why I want to create a resource library because people are going to be trying to smell things and like, and search for, what like lord knows what and our healthcare system is not set up for people doing that like look at q and on with unguided research yeah. jesus yeah so like i just i am trying to get ahead of the levy breaking and mm-hmm. i think we are in a good position as like a community where we've been seeing this for a while this isn't new mm-hmm. and it's going to be new for a lot of people and yeah I think we're going to be those experts, unfortunately, but fortunately for them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think, um, you know, I know that there's, and then I want to get back to smelling and candle making and all the things. Um, I think it's been really interesting to be on like social media during this time. because I think there's so much divisiveness between Lyme patients and like COVID long haulers. And I think personally, it's been really disappointing to see because we suffer from so many of the same symptoms and this shouldn't be like an us versus them situation because honestly I have a bad feeling that they're going to be treated just as badly as we are in the long run I just have no idea I don't think that they're going to have access to disability when I read that it was based on like based on an individual private medical evaluation I was like oh there's no way like there's no reason to get up in arms in this because unfortunately nobody's going to get taken care of um but what i have seen in like all of my legislative advocacy work and meetings virtually with politicians is that they are so much more open now to um quote unquote like avoiding another pandemic even though lyme disease and tick-borne disease is already a pandemic in my opinion um that they're taking it seriously and they're giving us the funding and they are the cdc is like very slowly like updating their guidelines and i think that true change really is coming unfortunately as a result of this global pandemic um but for all of the people that maybe lost their smell with COVID I'm working on it you're working on it and I was like kind of laughing when I was looking through like 
our stuff earlier because you're like, oh, I'm a candle maker now. And it's so funny to me because you're so much more than that. And you're so much more than that to our community and so many people. I'm like, you're the CEO and founder of a very successful candle company. You've been in Vogue. Like, give me a freaking break. You're like, I'm just a candle maker. And I'm like, your unofficial like publicist hype woman. Like, no, Trish is doing it all. Um, so, I mean, I just like, I don't know. I just don't. I, I'm one of those people that is like, I like to fly. It's hard to brag radar. about yourself. And I know that, but that's why I get to brag about you as your friend, <laughs> which I'm very lucky for. And you are using like so many of your newfound gifts and like newfound talents to serve our community. And mm-hmm. I almost feel like I can't even ask you this question because you've given me like a million ways that you're going to continue to serve the community. Like through your library and through the safe space you're setting up and through like you've the Lyme disease candle and like all these things. But I guess like, where do you see this all going in the future? Like what else, is there anything else that you haven't told us about? I mean, I like, I want to, I think I might have said this, but I'm gonna, I'm creating like just like a prototype that I want to have like several hubs. Like I want to have like three or four hubs of like studios in the United States and then in Europe and like around the world where they're just, I, I guess you can say like libraries, workshops that are um, going to be like, you know, I work out of there obviously, but also it, I want them to be places where people can work out of, but also go mm-hmm. to for classes and um, go to for therapy you know, group, like I'm partnering with Bella, Bellatrix, which is like a book club. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I'm just trying to create a community of conscious individuals. And I feel like that is lacking, but then also mm-hmm. right now, since we're all in our homes and also now 31.3% of the population has a uh, new chronic symptoms. I have a feeling people are going to be looking for more community and yeah. So I want, I, I've always been toying with the idea of doing something like that. And then the pandemic hit and now I'm like, well, Lord, it's time. And so time. I, yeah. And so, I mean, ideally it would be like a little tea house where like my essential oils are steeped and it's like a little garden and farm and there's, you know, so not like a Soho house by any means, yeah. but like more of a, like a wellness tea safe place for people to get education and yeah. also smell things and make things and you know create um I have a lot of friends that are like rappers and singers so I would do like sound mixing and have a booth in there and you know um are an ongoing art gallery pieces and working on one now a show based on dark matters is what it's Ooh. called yeah so I don't know. So we'll see. Well, I'm excited for whatever it is. So last, I know. last and final, or sorry, go ahead, Trish. No, I was going to say sensory experiences, man. I love it. I'll be there. Yes. Um, last and final question. I wanted to end and Matt gave me free reign to ask you the last and final question. Have it be whatever I wanted it to be. So I'm curious to know if you could share a meal with anyone dead, alive, made up, doesn't matter to me, who would it be and why? Whoa. Hmm. Honestly, right I, off the top of my head, it's going to sound so lame, Madam Curie, um, just, I, think she's so dope um but also like she's a female scientist that has done so much in the name of science that I don't think she was even credited for that like I feel like sitting down with her and like maybe getting her drunk you would find out so much shit (laughs) where you're like like you actually like invented time like you know or something like that and that would be my gut, but then my corny answer would be my grandfather. Yes. Oh, I, I love know. that. So, like, 
probably one of those two people. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I will allow you to pick both of them. You can share a meal with both. I mean, if they were sitting together, they would ignore me and have like a nerdy combo. And mm -hmm. I would be like, whoa, I'm just taking you, notes. You can have both as long as I can come. Yeah, I literally would just not, at least you would understand what they were saying. I wouldn't even understand. I'd just be sitting there like, yeah. Staring. <laughs> I feel that so hard though. <laughs> I also have to ask you, Trish, at this meal with your two people that I am now have forcibly invited myself to, which florist lane candle scent would you burn? Ooh. Um, I would have to probably do a Palo Santo rose because my grandfather i found out really likes roses actually you were there oh. when i found it out i had no I idea have... that medium the medium oh, that we had the phone call yes yeah. and i had no idea that he liked roses and i was talking to my mom it's like a whole family thing that everyone knew he liked roses oh, and i was I'll like tell her i I'm guess i dinner with her tomorrow just, night well tell her she was totally 100 percent correct about that and i had no She's idea always right She's the one who told I know, me, she and was like, there's ashes somewhere in your house and like your grandpa's like pissed about it, like how they're being stored. And I like went to my mom after and I was like, mom, we don't have any ashes in our house. Like I told Cindy she was wrong. Then my mom was like, no, we do. And I was like, no, no, <laughs> let's maybe get those out of here. So yeah, Cindy's never, I'm like, yeah. That's so funny. I'll tell it her. It's wild. I love so that. I would pick a rose candle because that man likes roses. Super okay. weird. Oh, I love I had that. had no idea. Thank you for listening to the special Tick Bootcamp interview with our guest, Trish Baden. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about Trish, please visit her on Instagram at Trish Baden, T-R-I-S-H-B-A-D-E-N, or at Floris Lane, F-L-O-R-E-S-L-A-N-E. Second, if you've enjoyed this episode of the Tick Bootcamp podcast, please share it with your friends on social media. Third, Tick Bootcamp has created a Tick Bite blueprint that has been inspired by past podcast guests, and we urge you to visit our website at tickbootcamp.com to view the blueprint. Please note we appreciate any input or improvement you'd like to share with us. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify to get your automatic episode updates of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. And finally, we thank you, our community, for your comments on our past podcast episodes. Please take a minute to leave us an honest review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, on social media, or even on our website. We make it a point to read every single one of the reviews we get. As always, thank you for listening.